Now, all of you will have heard studies on the life of Abraham, and they're usually character studies, uh, and it's a marvellous study, but this is not primarily a character study that we're undertaking this weekend. We're going to look at the way in which God gave Abraham seven promises in the course of his life from age 70 to 133. We're going to see that he could not give Abraham some of those promises until Abraham was ready to receive them. We're going to see that what God was doing in Abraham's life, for he is the father of the faithful, is what he's doing in your life and in mine. He is working out the process of redemption. We start small and step by step he takes us through our life. And when we're ready to receive the next phase of life, so it is granted. And that is the way that the life of Abraham unfolds. And we will see that, God willing, as we proceed. So when God spoke to Abram in the land of the Chaldees, Ur the Chaldees, Ur means the light of the conquerors, he spoke to him in the heart of Nimrudian apostasy. And so Abraham told his father Terah, and Terah takes his family and they go northwest along the Euphrates and they find themselves in Haran where God is to repeat that promise that he gave him in Ur five years later. And so his journeys, of course, are well known. But the question arises, <clears throat> why did Terah take his family to Haran? Well, because you see, brothers and sisters, we're told in Hebrews 11 verse 8, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. He was not told where to go. So where do you go? Where would Terah go? Well, it just so happens that Ur of the Chaldees was the most important place at that time for the worship of a god called Sin, S-I-N, who was the moon god. And people went there like they go to Jerusalem to be buried. It was, the, it was the heartland of their Nimrudian apostasy. So where's Tira going to go? Well, he goes to Haran, which is nowhere near a river, by the way. It's not on the Euphrates and it's not on the Tigris. It's in the middle. It just happens to be the second most important place for the worship of the moon god Sin. And this is why God appears five years later to Abram and says, you've got to get out of here. I asked you to do three things, you've done one, you've got to do the second. We're going to see how important that is, brothers and sisters, as we proceed here in this first study. So let's then stand back and review the seven promises that God made to Abraham between Genesis 12 and 22. Because this is the ground that we're going to be covering, God willing, over this weekend. And we're going to see that God delivers these promises in stages as Abram develops. It's not till the it's not till the fifth promise that his name is changed to Abraham, five being the divine number of grace. And we'll see all of the reasons behind that uh, as we proceed. Now, as, as we've just read from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, we have the first of seven promises to Abraham. It just happens to have seven clauses. And the first of those clauses points to the culmination of God's purpose with Abraham. The reason he calls Abraham brothers and sisters is because he was in the heart of Nimrudian apostasy. Nimrod had brought about the division of the nations, the loss of the safar, the lip, the language with which people expressed religion. Hebrew, by the way, is the, most, the greatest language in existence to express religion and praise. And they all had the one tongue. And only one man retained it after the rebellion of Nimrod, his name was Eber, because he refused to be involved in the building of the Tower of Babel. And so God left him with the Hebrew language, his own tongue. And of course, we end up with Hebrews, don't we? So here we've got, here we've got the problem brought by Nimrod. And God was determined to unwind that. Nimrod's rebellion led to 70 nations, and God said, right, I'm going to take one man from the heart of this apostasy and I'm going to work in him and when I'm finished, the whole world is going to be in that one man in the nation that comes from his loins, the nation of Israel. That's why the very first clause of the very first promise is about God's ultimate purpose 
He says, I will make of thee a great nation. He did not mean the nation in the days of David or in the days of Solomon. He meant the single nation that will remain on earth after 7,000 years of human history in the 8th millennium when God will be all and in all. There will only be one nation left then and that will be the nation of Israel. I will make of thee a great nation and every single member of it will be immortal. That's what he means. Right up front. In the very first promise. But Abraham's got a long way to go. He's got a long way to go. And we're going to see the process that God uses, uses to get him there. The same process he's using with you and me. Now the second promise is made in Genesis 12 verse 7. It is the promise of the land to Christ. Not to Abraham. Why not? Well because he hasn't met the conditions that are laid down in the first promise. And if you don't meet the conditions, well, you don't get the promise, do you? God's not going to promise Abram the land until he's met the conditions. And we'll review those conditions in a minute. The land is first promised to Abraham's seed. And we know who that is from Galatians 3 and verse 16. It is our Lord Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham. In Genesis 13, verses 14 to 17, we have the third promise where the land is finally promised to Abraham himself once he has met those three conditions. And we'll come to that in a minute. The fourth promise is in Genesis 15, which will be our second study uh, this morning, God willing. In Genesis 15, verses 13 to 21, we have the captivity and redemption of Abram's people and the cutting of a covenant. Abraham's seed, namely Christ, is guaranteed possession of the land from the Euphrates to the Nile. It's the content, of course, of the fourth promise. And we know that it's surrounded by that marvellous subject of the imputation of righteousness on the basis of faith. And we are going to be redeemed, brothers and sisters, by imputed righteousness given to us on the basis of our faith. And we'll come to that in our second study, God willing. In Genesis 17, verses 4 to 8, we have the fifth promise where Yahweh's fatherhood is delegated to Abraham. Now think about that. God delegating his fatherhood to a man? Yeah, that's why he waits until Abraham's been in the truth for 24 years. You don't give this to pups, do you? You don't give it to greenhorns. You don't pass on your fatherhood if you're the Almighty to someone who's not ready for it. So he says to Abraham, I'm delegating to you my fatherhood. Here's a knife. Cut off your flesh. You're not ready for certain things until you've been through the mill. And we're going to watch Abraham go through a couple of mills. And then the sixth promise comes along. In Genesis chapter 17, verses 15 and 16. In chapter 18, verse 10 and 14, we have the promised seed. Isaac is to be born within 12 months of God appearing in Genesis chapter 17. And we'll come to the details of that, God willing, in our third session here today. And then we have the seventh and final promise in Genesis chapter 22, verses 16 to 18, on the back, of course, of Abraham offering up Isaac, his son. What a marvellous chapter that is in the word of God. And we'll come to that, God willing, in our exhortation tomorrow. And this is where the promises are made unconditional to Abraham. You'll all recall the words of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 to 18, where the writer says that because God could swear by no greater, he swore by himself that by two immutable things, things that are unchangeable, by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled into a city of refuge. Remember that? In that context of Hebrews chapter 6, you know what, what the writer says? He says that Abraham obtained the promises. He doesn't say that Abraham received the promises because if you're receiving them, they're made to you as a promise. He says he obtained the promise. So God says to him, in blessing, I will bless thee. In other words, the promises are made unconditional to Abraham. He's 133 years of age and God says to him effectively, you're in the kingdom. I couldn't have asked from anyone more than what you have given and you willingly gave it. You gave your only beloved son. 
And because you did that, I won't withhold my son from you. You're in the kingdom, Abel. Because I will complete the work in the sacrifice of my son. That's how important that seventh promise is. We're told that in Hebrews chapter 6. But it's preceded by a covenant with Gentiles. Where seven new lambs are offered. Genesis 21, 22 to 32. Hence the naming of the well where that covenant was made with this Gentile king of Bimelech who became a Christadelphian on that day. Hence it's called Beer Sheba, the well of the seven. And it just so happens in this context, brothers and sisters, that the word Shabbat, which is the word for swearing, swore an oath, just like God in chapter 22 verse 16 swore by himself, that's the word Shabbat, which means to seven oneself, got it? This is the seventh promise. And Genesis 22 is full of sevens. And Genesis 21, you've got a covenant made with Gentiles, which is confirmed by seven ewe lambs, and they call it the well of the seven. And Abraham takes Isaac from the well of the seven. He makes the sacrifice and goes back to the well of the seven. Got it? Absolute precision in the way our God works, brothers and sisters. Nothing, nothing is out of place. We're going to see that over and over and over again. And it's a simple fact to those who check their concordances that the word Shaba and Sheba just happen to occur seven times in this context. It culminates in Genesis 22 verse 18. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And we know what that means to you and me. So, what does it really mean to be blessed in Abram? So let's go back to the first promise, shall we? This is where we're going to focus our attention here in this first study. Here are the three conditions that were laid down by God when he spoke to him at 70 years of age in Ur of the Chaldees. The first condition is, get thee out of thy country. And that's what they do. He tells his father, Tira says, let's get out of here. And they go to Haran. But the second condition is, and from thy kindred. In other words, you've got to leave your larger family, Abram. And he does, doesn't he? When he leaves Haran and crosses the Euphrates. But the third condition is, and from thy father's house. And that doesn't happen until Lot leaves him in Genesis chapter 13. And until that condition is met, brothers and sisters, Abram is not promised the land, as we shall see in a moment. So the three primary conditions that had to be met are laid down first. What does that teach you and me? We're in, the, we're in the faith of Abraham, aren't we? Yeah. When we came into the faith by baptism into Christ, brothers and sisters, there are conditions laid down that we might ultimately attain the kingdom. Is that not true? And if we do not meet those conditions... We will not be in the kingdom. That's the principle that God is teaching here. So the promises, what Peter calls exceeding great and precious promises, he says, will lead you to eternal life. God's given us everything required for life. He means eternal life and godliness. They're in those promises. But you have to meet the conditions. And that's where it comes back home to you and me. So here's the first promise with its seven clauses. And of course we know them well, don't we? The first one we've made comment on already. It's, it's apocalyptic in its structure. You know how the apocalypse is structured? You get a final vision of where God's taking you. This is all through the scriptures. It's in places like Isaiah 19, the first verse. Final picture of where you're going. And then he tells you how to get there. Alright, that's what he does here. Where God is going is to establish on earth one nation, the nation of Israel. Because you know he promises this. He says, in, he says in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 11 and in 46, 27, 28 he says, Though I make a full end of all nations, Israel, where I've scattered you, I will not make a full end of thee. They will remain forever. Chastised, yes, terribly. But they will be the only surviving nation on earth, brothers and sisters, at the end of the seventh millennium. That's where he's going. I'll make of thee a great nation. 
Yeah, I want to be in that nation, don't you? Well, we're already members of the Israel of God, so we've made, made a good start. What we've got to do now is to let God work in our lives like he worked in the life of Abraham. Because it's all about redeeming us, brothers and sisters. And it's a process, sometimes a painful process, as we shall see. I will make of thee a great nation. What a wonderful way to start. And I will bless thee. What does that mean? Well, if you went to a church, they would say, well, what that means is you go down to the priest and he waves something over you or sprinkles holy water on you or, you know, does this with some kind of canister. Wouldn't they? That's what the churches would say, wouldn't they? Well, we're going to see exactly what that means for you and me from Scripture in a, in a moment. I will make thy name great because he's going to be the father of the faithful and thou shalt be a blessing because through him and his seed all families of the earth will be blessed and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. In other words, those who want to get involved in this process of blessing and they attach themselves to you, Abraham, I will bless them, I will redeem them. But those who curse you, those who turn away from what I'm doing in you, will be cursed. Two different words for curse, by the way, in Hebrew. Okay, so if you don't attach yourself to Abraham, you'll be cursed. Where's that curse coming from? You stay in Adam. You stay in Adam. And that's a curse, isn't it? So here we've got God setting out the plan for all those who would ultimately come to eternal life. And then we've got that, that uh, final seventh clause. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So this great nation that, that Abraham has promised, we've seen what that really means, brothers and sisters. And though Israel did become relatively great, as 1 Kings 3 verse 8, you read, And my servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people. They might have been a great people. They weren't truly a great nation. Great nations don't fall off the end of the plank, do they? into the sea of nations and that's what happened to Israel their glory under Solomon faded away to nothing that's not a great nation is it what God's talking about is a nation that will go on forever and its members will all be immortal that's the nation he's talking about and we are going to be there brothers and sisters by the grace of our God so what about this word nation or nations I want, you to, I want to show you the position of the word of God this word nation or nations in the plural is goy or goyim. I am on the end makes it plural. It means a nation or a people. It's now masculine in the Hebrew. It first occurs in Genesis 10 verse 5 in the word Gentiles in the King James Version and nations in the same verse. The next four occurrences of this word goy or goyim are in Genesis chapter 10 verse 20, verse 31 and verse 32 where it appears twice. The seventh occurrence, now you'll know the significance, you know I've been labouring this number seven. The seventh occurrence of this word in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, is in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 2. I will make of thee a great nation. Now isn't that significant? The seventh occurrence of the word. And the word great here, that precedes that word nation, this word great is the Hebrew word gadol. That's also the seventh occurrence of that Hebrew word in the Old Testament. But what about the word families that we met? Well, the Hebrew word families is mishpakar. It means a clan or a family or a tribe, hence a people or a nation. The first occurrence of this Hebrew word is in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 19, where it's rendered kinds. The next five occurrences, it's rendered families in Genesis 10 verse 5, 18, 20, 31 and 32. The seventh occurrence of this Hebrew word in the Old Testament is in Genesis 12 verse 3. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Ah, that's interesting, isn't it? Well, it just so happens... But this word blessed here, it's the Hebrew word barak. The seventh occurrence in the Old Testament is in Genesis 12 verse 2. I will bless thee. But this one at the end of verse 3 is the tenth. 
the tenth occurrence of that word. And ten stands for all. Now you've seen the predominance of seven, haven't you? When I went to school, seven times ten was seventy. And seventy is the biblical number for the nations. Got it? In thee shall all families that were brought about by Nimrod's rebellion, 70 of them, in thee, they're all going to be blessed. They're going to come back into one. And I'm starting with Abram. I'll develop from him a nation. That nation will be called Israel. And at the end of the seventh millennium, I will be all in all. They'll all be in Israel. I'll have one nation again. And they'll all be talking my tongue, my religion. And using my language to praise me. That's what God's about, brothers and sisters. That's the big picture. That's why we were called. All right? That's why the Abrahamic promises are so critical to our faith. And God, when you believed them and you were baptised, said, Right, I'm going to grab hold of you and work in your life like I worked in Abraham's life. It's going to be painful. You're going to have problems. You're going to collapse at times. I'll pick you up. And when I pick you up and you're ready, I'll deliver the next phase of your life. Is that not true? Is that happening in your life? It's happening in mine. Am I an orphan? No. None of us are orphans. If you're a Christadelphian and you have the hope of Israel, this is what God is doing in your life, brothers and sisters. And he will not give up on you until he's done. He'll get you there into that one great nation. And that too will happen by phases. It's happened in his son, about to happen with us. We will be made immortal at his return. And it will happen at the end of the millennium when every single soul on earth will be immortal. Because of his promises to Abraham. That's where we're heading in this study. You got a bit of a feel for that now? Yeah. Is this a character study? Yes. But it's a whole lot more than a character study. So what does it mean to be blessed with faithful Abraham? So this word blessed here, I've just pointed that out, it's Barak. It happens to occur four times in this first promise. And four is the number in the scriptures for righteousness. Now some of you will say, oh you're always saying these things, you don't prove them. Well let me just give you a little bit of a nutshell proof of four being the number of righteousness. The most holy, the very centre of righteousness was what? Perfect cube. Perfect cube. When God gave the first great promise of the Bible in Genesis 1, in the six days of creation and the seventh day of rest, he was setting forth the 6,000 year history of mankind. True? And then followed by the millennium. What day did he create the sun? What day did he bring the sun in relation to the earth? It might have been, I believe it was there. But what, what day did he bring the sun in relation to the earth? The fourth day. How long did he wait after the creation of Adam before he brought his son on the scene? 4,000 years. And using 2 Peter 3 verse 8, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand... We know what was happening, don't we? And what did he call his son just before he was born? In Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2. Do you remember? The son... S-O-N? No. No, no, no. The S-U-N, the Son of Righteousness, fourth day. And the perfect man was born. The man bearing our, our nature, who was perfectly obedient. The epitome of righteousness. Got it? I could give you another hundred quotes, okay? Four is the number of righteousness in the Bible. This word, Barak, is used four times in this promise and there's purpose in that. I want you to come to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, we have Peter addressing a huge crowd. we come to verses 25 and 26 of Acts 3, the end of his address, we read this. 
He says to the Jews before him, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, here's your quote, this is from Genesis 22, verse 18, the very last words of the promise, right of the seventh promise, he says, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. And then he says this, Unto you first, he means the Jews, Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. Now you can be sure it's not a papal blessing, is it? Not some kind of papal blessing. What is it then? What is this blessing in Abraham? Well, he tells us, because he goes on to say this. He sent him to bless you in turning every one of you from his iniquities. Now you see that word there in the yellow on the screen? That's another translation. That's the word wickedness there. That's the Greek word poneria. It just happens to occur seven times in the New Testament. Well, that's perfectly accidental. It is the word poneria, depravity, iniquity, wickedness, evil purposes and desires. None of you have got those. You haven't got that problem, have you? None of you have got the problem of depravity, wickedness, evil purposes and desires. Well, of course you have, because I got them. And that's what God's doing in our lives, brothers and sisters. That's why we are called into Abraham. He says, I will bless you. He's going to spend the rest of our lives ridding us of our iniquities. And if that is what's happening in your life, then you are a son or a daughter of Abraham. Because God's at work. And he's turning you away little by little. Improving your character. Improving your obedience. Building your faith. He's doing all the things that are necessary to turn you away from your iniquities. All he wants is our ready response. Our willingness to work with him. Our faith. That's what he wants. He can do great things in our lives, brothers and sisters, if we've got faith. You see, Paul says in Galatians 3 verse 8, when he talks about Abraham receiving the gospel. That was the gospel, wasn't it? The promises made him with the gospel. He says, God was justifying him by faith. He's going to render him righteous. That's what justify means, to declare righteous. So how do we get it? We get it by faith. So come along to Hebrews chapter 11 with me. Now how well known is this passage? Hebrews 11 and verse 1. I mean, it's fundamental when we teach our interested friends the truth. One of the first places you take them, isn't it, is to Hebrews 11 and verse 1. So it's very fundamental. And the writer says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now this word substance is hypostasis, and it means a setting under or support or a foundation. It's got to do with substance. It's not a bad translation. Something that's solid. And so Brother Thomas translates it, Faith is the confident anticipation of things hoped for. A full persuasion of things not seen. And the RV translation chimes in and says, Faith is the giving of substance to things hoped for. In other words, when you read these things in the Word and you believe them, they become real. So, for example, when you read Ezekiel 40-48 to about the temple of the future age, and you see Ezekiel walking around it, the whole point of it being there is that you can do what Ezekiel did. Reach out and touch it and make it real. Now, it's, it's real in your mind, isn't it? You can't actually see it outside of you, but it's real in your mind. It's as real as you sitting in front of me. That's what faith does. It gives substance to things hoped for. And it's the evidence of things not seen. Now, this word evidence is elekos in the Greek. It means logical proof. Evidence, demonstration, or a convincing argument. You know, Brother Thomas adds these words. He says this. Faith is reality and proof. The person who has it, he says, embraces certain things promised as realities. And certain transactions which he, he hadn't seen 
but he reads about them in the word of God, he, he accepts them as things proved. The, the fact that they're in the word of God is all over. They're proved. That's what faith does. And without faith, you will not be in the kingdom. Abraham is the father of the faithful. And he believed what the writer of the Hebrews says in verse 6, that God exists. It's the first thing. I know a lot of people who believe God exists, but they don't believe the second thing. The second thing is that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. And if they believe that, then he can grab hold of them and do what he did in your life for what he did for Abraham. That, brothers and sisters, is why this study of the life of Abraham is so important to us. So let's come back now and dig into to Genesis chapter 12. We've got our basis, the reason why we're here. Let's have a look at what happens in the life of Abraham after he received this promise for the second time in Haran and made that big move across the Euphrates and down into the land. So we read in this record, in Genesis chapter 12 and, and verse 4, that Abram departed as Yahweh had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. He took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and all the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth. And I want you to notice, you know, when you read your Bible, you've got to read it carefully. You've got to ask, I wonder why it says that. Here's one of those cases. Let's read it. It says, And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. Now, if you're going to go into the land of Canaan, it's like, you know, I set out from, uh, I set out from uh, Ancaster or Hamilton uh, yesterday, and I was going into the land of Toronto. Do you need to be told that I arrived in the land of Toronto? Of course you don't. Look what it says here. They went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And then guess what it says at the end of verse 6? It says, and the Canaanite was then in the land. Well, yeah, just like there are Toronto people in Toronto. You got it? You've got to ask yourself, I wonder why it says it like that. Well, it says it for a reason. Because he's coming to the land of promise, brothers and sisters, and who's in it? Canaanites. And Canaan, you know, comes from the root kana. It means to bend the knee, to get down on the ground. Hence to humiliate. And sometimes to be vanquished or subdued. You see, it's talking about the problem that we all confront that stands between us and an inheritance in the land promised to Abraham. You know what that is? Human nature. The thing that stands between me and an eternal inheritance in the land that promised, was promised to Abraham is my nature. It gets in the way, doesn't it? And you've got to deal with that. There's a Canaanite in the land. Yeah. So the Apostle Paul chimes in, in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21, and he says about our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall transform, and by the way, this is the King James Version down here, who shall change our vile body. Remember that? You've got the King James? Well, it's not a great translation. And there's certain vileness about the human body, I'll, I'll agree. But it's not a good word. It should be translated this way. Who shall transform the body... Of our humiliation to its becoming conformed to the body of his glory. That's Young's literal translation. And it's a good translation. And it tells us, brothers and sisters, what our problem is. Now, I don't know about you. I can't speak for you. But I know that my body humiliates me. It humiliates me in a number of different ways. Through sin and failure. Yeah. And through decrepitude. Anybody here experiencing decrepitude, sickness and disease? Yeah, it's a humiliating thing, isn't it? And we're dealing with it. It's standing in our inheritance. It's got to be dealt with. And God is going to show us how in the life of Abraham. That's why this, this consideration of the way he works is so important to you and me. So where does he come? Look at verse 6 very first place it's recorded. Now, he may not, have, it may not have been the first place. But God tells us as much as we need to know. The very first place in the record that Abram comes to in the land is Shechem, verse 6. And Abram passed through the land under the place of Shechem. 
And it says unto the plain of Moray. The word there, plain, actually means an oak, right? It's the oak of Moray. This is a very important oak, by the way. It makes its appearance in Genesis 34, in Joshua 24, and you can go on and on, all right? This is a very important oak. And Moray means a teacher. Now, the oak represents strength. So God is going to, he's, going to, he's teaching him a lesson. He's saying, the very first place you come is this place Shechem, which means to shoulder a burden. And of course, the shoulder is the place where you take the weight. See, it's got, This is the word that is used of our Lord Jesus Christ in Isaiah 9 verse 6. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Shechem. Because you see, it's bearing responsibility. So what God is teaching Abram is, you come into this land, you've got a problem. See those Canaanites? That represents your nature. You've got a problem. You've got to make some choices. You've got to make the choice to bear the responsibilities of the truth. You make a decision here. And Shechem, therefore, in Scripture becomes the place where people make decisions, don't they? Look at them, and you've done a study on this, I'm sure. You've followed Shechem through the Bible. Every single time it's referred to. It's about people making decisions to bear responsibility or otherwise. I mean, who's the last that you know? The woman of Samaria, remember? In John chapter 4. She's got to make decisions. It's Shechem. It's the place of decision making. Do you see, can you see this where these two arrows are pointing? That's Mount Ebal. That's Mount Gerizim. We were there just 18 months ago. And I was standing on Mount Gerizim, looking over towards Mount Ebal. And we went down to the city of Shechem, the old town of Shechem down here. And between the shoulders, you see, look, if you were looking down on, from above a man who didn't have anything on upstairs, you would think that's his shoulder blades, wouldn't you? That's why they called it Shechem. It means the shoulder. And that's why it becomes this place of responsibility, decision-making, to bear responsibility. That's why God brought the whole nation here in Joshua chapter 8. Remember? And they shouted out, half the nation on one side of the, on Gerizim and half the nation on evil. They shouted out the blessings and the cursings of the law. Yeah, how to make decisions about what you're going to do in life. That's the principle of Shechem. That's why God brings him here, the very first place, to make those choices. And there's strength here, brothers and sisters. You know what the strength is? In this oak, the symbol of strength and durability. This oak of moray, and moray means the teacher. Yeah, there's strength in teaching. That, how fundamental is that? Really? It's fundamental, isn't it? This is how we convert people. You teach them the truth. You take them to the promises of Abraham. Yeah. And so what we find is in verse 7, the second promise is delivered. But it's not to Abraham. He hasn't met the conditions yet. So this second promise in verse 7, And Yahweh appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed I will give this land. And there he built an altar, Unto Yahweh who appeared unto him. So he makes sacrifice. Now we know of course who this seed is don't we? Because the Apostle Paul in Galatians 3 verse 16 says. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to seeds as of many but as of one. And to thy seed. Now these are the quoted words. All right? And to thy seed which is Christ. Now Paul's actually citing the words from Genesis 13 verse 15. You want to cast your eye across the page to Genesis 13 verse 15. He's actually citing the exact words that are in that verse. And to thy seed. But of course it's a repetition of what we read in Genesis 12 verse 7. So when you read in Genesis 12 verse 7 of the seed, it's not a reference to natural Jews born of Abraham it's a reference to one man the man Christ Jesus he is the seed of Abraham and we know that we know the argument in Galatians 3 don't we that if we're baptized into Christ then we become Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise so that is where God's up to with Abraham he's not ready to be promised the land yet he's in it but he's not ready to receive it. He's got to meet the third condition. 
Christ, therefore, already has a title to the land, brothers and sisters. He has a title to that land. We're going to see that in our next study. He's already got the land. He had the land in Abraham's day. Now you might say, well, he wasn't there. No, he wasn't there. But he had the land in Abraham's day, as we shall see. So there's a challenge for Abraham here. The primary conditions, which we read in verse 1 of this chapter, must be met before the promise can be fulfilled. What were they? Get thee out of thy country. It's about citizenship. It's about leaving behind the fact that you're Canadian or Australian and coming into the commonwealth of Israel. It's all about citizenship. To which country do you really belong? You Canadian citizens? Well, of course you are. When you get your pension, you've got to be a Canadian citizen. Okay? But you're not really, are you? You're citizens of the commonwealth of Israel. Members of the Israel of God. Our citizenship, says Paul in Philippians 3, is in heaven. Okay, so it's all about, that's number one. And from thy kindred, from your natural heritage, which means you're leaving behind your culture, you know, the the way that you were brought up. You leave it behind. How many many different cultures do we have in this hall today? Fourteen, I believe. In the church street, you've got fourteen different uh, countries, cultures that you come from. True? Yeah, but you're all one in Christ Jesus. Yeah, that's the second thing. Your natural heritage is left behind. But then comes the third one. And Abraham hadn't met this one yet. And from thy father's house is from his family. And in Genesis 13 verses 14 to 17, God makes the promise of the land to Abraham now. Why? Well, verse 14 tells you. Verse 14 says in chapter 13, And Yahweh said unto Abram, notice this, After that lot was separated from him. Third condition. He's left his father's house. And God straight away says, you've met the conditions. And then he says to him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it into thy seed forever. The promise of the land is given to him. Because the conditions are met. So come back then to verse 8 of Genesis 12. Well, we read this. This is the second place he comes to. Having made sacrifice in Shechem, having accepted the responsibilities, it says he removed from thence and to a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto Yahweh and he called upon the name of Yahweh. Now we know what Bethel means, don't we? It means the house of God. We know that in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, Paul tells us that it's the ecclesia. That thou mayest, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself, he says, in, in the house of God, which is the ecclesia of living God. We know what Bethel stands for. It's the ecclesia. But what about Hai? Well, Hai means ruin. And you see, he's a choice to make. I want to show you a picture in a minute where we stood five years or five or six years ago at Bethel. I'll show you a picture of the highway that runs up the central massif of the land along the mountains of Israel. Bethel's on the west, Hai's on the east of that major highway that goes up through the West Bank. We'll show you that. And you'll see the principles that Abraham had to play out here. It requires, of course, choosing the house of God over ruin, doesn't it? You want to choose the house of God over ruin? What does it require? Sacrifice and commitment. So it says he made sacrifice and he called upon the name of Yahweh. You don't, you can't choose the house of God, brothers and sisters, unless you make sacrifice and commitment. It's the principle God's teaching, Abram. So here it is. Here's the we're actually standing. We're standing at Bethel. These are, the, these are ancient ruins of Bethel. Now there's a place called Beitin, just down the, to the south of this, which, you know, tradition, and tradition's usually wrong, isn't it? The tradition says that that's, that this is, that's not. This is, has been proven to be Bethel. And over here, this is, the, this is the highway, by the way, separated two-lane highway. Over here is the height of a place called Hai, or Ai, as it was in the book of Joshua. 
It means ruin. And it's toward the east, because if that's the choice you make, you're going back to Ur of the Chaldees. If he'd gone east, he's heading back to Ur of the Chaldees. Back to Nimrod. Not going back there. So he goes to Bethel. He's between these two. He goes to Bethel. And there he makes sacrifice and commits his way to his God. That's the principle, brothers and sisters, of this. But you know, when you make choices like that, you're going to be challenged. And Abram's challenged. Look at verse 9. And Abram journeyed going on still toward the south, the Negev. And there was a famine in the land. And Abraham went down. And he did, physically. I mean, on a map you're going down. And spiritually he was going down. It's a wrong choice. He went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Well, why didn't the Canaanites go down? Were the Canaanites getting direct help from God? No. So why didn't the Canaanites go to Egypt? They stayed behind. You see, he makes a wrong decision. He's got divine help. Oh yes, there's a famine. This is the trials that come into our life. You make decisions, God's going to test you. He's going to prove you as to whether or not you're really genuine. All right? Abraham messes it up. Now some people don't like me criticising Abraham. So I'll forewarn you about that. You're going to hear a bit of criticism of Abraham. You know why? Because God criticises him. God criticises him. And he does that for a reason, brothers and sisters. Because we put men like Abraham on a pedestal. And we think, well, I can never be like him. Rubbish! God wants you to be like him. So he's showing you, Abraham, warts and all. And if he shows you, Abraham, warts and all, because he's just a son of Adam like you and me then you can take encouragement and say, if God can do that for him, then he can do it for me. That's the principle of that. That's why I'll criticise Abraham where God does. Because we need to understand that principle. None of this business of putting men on pedestals. So here we are. He's made a wrong decision. And it's a decision that will affect his family's future for two generations. He makes, he, tell, he tells a lie. Doesn't he? He tells a lie about Sarai. He tells it again in Genesis 20, as we're going to see in our studies. And then Isaac picks up his father's practice. The only mistake Isaac makes, by the way, in the record of Scripture. He picks up his father's practice and tells a lie about Rebecca. I mean, Abraham's lie was at least a half-truth. Isaac's was, a, was a, a full lie. So you see... You can make decisions in life, you can make choices in life that will affect other generations in your family. This is 14 to 15, his worst fears are realised. You know, he, tell, he tells Soraya, look, you're a very beautiful woman. It wasn't so much her beauty only, brothers and sisters, it was the colour of her skin. It was a Shemite. So she was, you know, she was, she was whitish coloured skin, whereas, of course, Egyptians are brown. So when she comes, oh, look at that, see? She was a very pretty woman, but it was the colour of her skin that attracted the Egyptians. And so, of course, his worst fear to realise, he says, uh, she's my sister, Pharaoh takes her into his palace, into his harem, the harem of Pharaoh, and there, of course, God has to save her, which is what Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3. God has to intervene to save her. So the record told us he went down, means to descend, to decline, to sink down. But in chapter 13, when he's released by Pharaoh, kicked out an embarrassed Christadelphian. He's kicked out of Egypt. It says in chapter 13, verse 1, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. He was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. He went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, and to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, and to the place of the altar which he had made there at the first... And there Abram called on the name of Yahweh. What a spectacular piece of scripture that is. Ever been embarrassed by failing in front of Gentiles? Ever, ever brought the truth into disrepute by behaviour? I'm guilty. All right, I'm guilty. And I'll never, ever forget it. And he done it once. That's enough. All right, Abraham's guilty. The truth has been brought into disrepute in Egypt. 
They kick the Christadelphians out. Right, and away he goes, humble, tail between his legs. So what do you do, brothers and sisters, when you mess up? What do you do? Well, you do what Abraham did. You make a new start. And the first thing you've got to do is go up. He says it went up, and the word in the Hebrew is Allah. It means to ascend. You, you come back to God. You get back to God. He was very rich. This was the seeds of the future trouble in the family, leading, leading to Lot having to leave. But it says this in verse 3. He went back to the place where he had been at the beginning. Then we read in verse 4, it was the place where he had been first. That's what you do. You go back to Tours. You go back to your roots. You go back to the beginning. And you make a new start. And if you're forgiven, if you ask for forgiveness for your failures, God says, right, I'm with you. We'll make a new start together. And we'll make that start from where you began. Go back to your principles. Go back to the choice in Shechem. Go back to Bethel. Choose between ruin and the house of God. Choose it again. And I'll be with you. That's the principle. That's how God redeems his people. But poor old Lot, when the time came, he looks down. You can't see it here. It's too hazy. This is a picture taken from the heights of, of AI. Ruin. And it is in ruins today. And you look down from there. Over to the left, you've got the Valley of Achor. Down there, you've got the Surkar of Moab, the Plain of Jordan. And Lot looks down and he sees the green and we know the rest, don't we? We know where that led, brothers and sisters. So here we've got the beginning of our story of God working to redeem Abraham. We can be blessed with faithful Abraham.